with Fort Wayne with us, it's just always special and it's always exciting. I really appreciate this day. I do have a confession to make. Yesterday evening, I went out to dinner with an unmarried woman. My wife forgot her wedding ring. She had been working and she forgot her wedding ring. So during the dinner, I told her a little bit about what I'm going to talk about today. So we went out to lunch today and we went to this Thai restaurant down there by Trader Joe's and she orders a Thai iced coffee and she says, I'm gonna need it because I heard the sermon's gonna be really dull. <laughs> so the expectation is very low here. Well, brethren, it, it is very good to be with you today and it's a pleasure to give this message to you. I've been working on it for a very long time and um, I hope it'll be really inspiring to you as it was to me in putting it together. But there is a, a problem solving technique called the five whys technique. Not the five guys, as in the burger joint, but five whys with a W. And it was originally developed by Sakichi Toyota, who was a Japanese inventor and industrialist and member of the Toyota family, which founded Toyota Motor Company. And the technique became an integral part of a system called the Toyota Production System, which is focused on quality continuous improvement, continuous improvement. And many companies around the world now use this tool, this five wise tool or a variant of it. And it's an effective tool for determining the root cause or finding the fundamental cause of a defect or a failure or the cause of an accident or a processing or manufacturing problem or virtually any cause and effect situation. And the five whys analysis technique is a scientific approach that asks why five times when a problem is found. And by repeating why five times, the nature of the problem can oftentimes be identified and its solution becomes clear. And I first came into contact with the five whys technique in the 1990s as an automotive engineer working for GM, which also uses the technique. And it's uncanny that five whys, more often than not, gets to the root cause of a problem, although fewer can sometimes do it, and sometimes it may take a little bit more than five whys, but usually five is kind of a, a special number in this case. But it's very important when using this technique that the right questions or whys are asked. So a skilled team is usually assembled to make sure that you're asking the right questions and then you're properly answering those questions. It's very important for the technique to work. It's also the case that there may be multiple root causes of a particular problem. So the technique may have to be used more than one time. Now there are some critics of this technique and it's not perfect, but it is widely used. It's part of the Six Sigma mythology that is used all across the world for quality improvement and for problem analysis. And it remains a powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool for problem resolution and continuous improvement and quality. Let's look at a simple example, just so you can kind of get the feel. A car has a dead battery, the battery's dead. Why is the battery dead? That's the first why. And after some investigation, it's found that the alternator is not charging the battery. Why is the alternator not charging the battery? That's the second why. After more investigation, it's found that the drive belt that couples the engine to the alternator is broken. So the alternator was not being turned by the engine, so it wasn't working. Why is the drive belt broken? the third why. After more investigation, it's determined that the drive belt is far beyond its useful service life. Why is the drive belt beyond its useful service life? That's the fourth why. Answer, the vehicle was not properly inspected and maintained. Why was the vehicle not properly maintained? The fifth why. And the answer to this fifth question reveals the root cause. The owner was negligent. Now it's possible to continue asking further why questions to try to determine well, why was the owner negligent and it can help to resolve the problem. But generally five whys gets to the root cause. 
of the problem. Now you may say, well, this sounds very familiar. You know, most of us have, have experienced one or more of our kids asking us about something and then saying, but why? But why? But why? Eventually you get to the point where you have to tell them to go ask their mother. <laughs> Usually sooner rather than later, it gets to the point that only God can answer further but why questions. Well, today we are here and we're observing God's holy day, the Feast of Trumpets. And I remember Mr. Armstrong in the 1980s asking the familiar question on holy days, brethren, why are we here? How many of you remember that? I know it's, he died in 1986, it's hard to believe. But that was a very familiar question. Well, today in this message, we're going to use the five whys analysis technique to answer this question of why we are here today on the Feast of Trumpets. And I've entitled this message, Five Whys and the Feast of Trumpets. So the first why, of course, in honor of Mr. Armstrong, is why are we here today? Why are we here today, the first why? So the first level answer is because, is because God commands us to be here to observe the Feast of Trumpets before him. I know we've already looked at it, but let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23. We'll just read it again. It won't take too long. Leviticus 23, verse 23 through 25. Mr. Cobb also turned here. But God tells Moses, he said, speak, he said, speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy con convocation or a commanded assembly. You shall do no customary work on it. It is like a Sabbath, like a weekly Sabbath, but it's a holy day, and you shall observe an offering made by fire to the Lord. So we are to come out of our normal work, just like we do every seventh day on the weekly Sabbath. So God commands us to be here. But notice Joshua chapter 22, verse 5. Joshua chapter 22, verse 5. Joshua's talking to many of the elders of the Israelites. He says in verse 5, he says, But take careful heed to do the commandment in the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul or your life. We need and we must love God. To walk in all of his commandments, to hold fast to him, to serve him with all of our heart, with all of our life. And that means as we also heard in the Bible study today, earlier, that God is to be at the center of our lives. But notice 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 through 3 next. 1 John chapter 5. And we'll read verse 2 through 3. John writes, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. So the true love of God compels us to obey him to keep his commandments, which are not burdensome, they're meaningful and they're valuable. We're not being forced to be here today, but we wish to be here in obedience to God because we love God and we wish to obey him. We wish to hold fast to him, to obey him and to serve him, even if it is a sacrifice to be here. 
We are willing to serve God and to do it. So we're here because God commands us to be here as a first level answer. But notice Luke chapter 11, verse 27 through 28. Luke chapter 11, verse 27 through 28. As it happened, as he, Jesus, spoke these things, that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. And he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. There are great blessings upon those who obey God. And those blessings, brethren, happen in numerous and in amazing ways. So the answer to the first why, which was why are we here, is that God commands us to be here together before him to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So now let's consider the second why. Why does God command us to keep the Feast of Trumpets? Why? The answer is we need to be reminded, refreshed, and encouraged concerning God's master plan and our part in it that is surely coming in the future. I'll say that again. We need to be reminded, refreshed, and encouraged concerning God's master plan and our part in it that is surely coming in the future. We live in this present evil world as God's word refers to it, a world that is increasingly filled with sin, distractions, deception, negativity, and discouragement. We must live in this world, and, and all of this can have an effect on us. We can easily become discouraged and distracted. We can fall into sins. We can even be affected by deception. And of course, Satan, as the god of this world, is heavily involved in targeting us. We can also be affected by other problems of life, such as accidents and difficulties at work and illness family problems, and other problems that can result from bad decisions, including from others that affect us. But in the midst of all of this, God tells us that he is in control and his will will stand. Last time I read an excerpt from this book, Unexplained Mysteries of World War II by William B. Brewer, and several people commented that they like it. There's another story in here I'd like to take the time to read you. It's not very long. But it's called Churchill's Sudden Impulse. Beginning with the Battle of Britain in 1940, German air attacks on England, particularly London, were so frequent that most of the sturdy British became adjusted to them, if not indifferent, indifferent toward the deadly bombardments. Air raids became a way of life. Among those who endured the Luftwaffe's heavy assaults was Prime Minister Winston S. Churchill, known widely as the British Bulldog. On May 10, 1940, King George VI summoned the cherubic, cigar-chomping Churchill to Buckingham Palace and asked him to take over the reins of government. He would succeed 70-year-old Neville Chamberlain, who for two years had been trying to appease Adolf Hitler, the Nazi warlord. Churchill, then the first lord of the Admiralty, accepted eagerly, and when Chamberlain resigned the next day, Churchill took over as prime minister and began directing the British war effort. With, Hith with Hitler's mighty juggernaut poised across the English Channel and preparing to pounce on England, a nation at bay, and with the powerful Luftwaffe pounding the British Isles, Churchill felt that as a leader, it was his job to be seen by his beleaguered people and fighting men. Widely known for his courage, Winston Churchill left the relative safety of his bomb shelter 
deep underground and traveled at night to various anti-aircraft batteries to inspire the crews. One night during, this, during an especially heavy Luftwaffe bombing, he had just visited a battery whose gun barrels were red hot from almost constant firing, and he was strolling back to his waiting black limousine. An aide opened the right rear door, and the prime minister started to climb in to take his customary seat in the vehicle, just as he had done hundreds of times before. Suddenly, Churchill had a change of heart. Walking around the back of the limo, he opened the door on the other side and got in, seating himself on the left. Accustomed to the prime minister's periodic fits of impetuousness, I think maybe you know what I mean, impetuousness, butcher that, the aide made no inquiries about Churchill's sudden decision. Picking its way through the blacked out streets, the limo had driven for about 10 minutes when there was an ear splitting blast. A bomb had exploded nearby, jolting the automobile and causing it to careen on its two right wheels for perhaps a hundred yards before righting itself. I must say that was some ride, Churchill grumbled tongue in cheek. Later he explained that my beef on the left hand side of the limo had caused it to pull down instead of turning over. When Lady Churchill asked her husband about his close call with death or serious injury, he replied, something said stop, just as I started to climb into the car. It then appeared to me that I was told I was meant to get in into the door on the other side and sit there, and that's what I did. Later, Churchill told a miners group, I sometimes have a feeling, in fact, I have it very strongly, a feeling of interference. I want to stress it, I have a feeling sometimes that some guiding hand has interfered. Brethren, God did intervene many times in World War II. One of the airplanes that in the Battle of Midway from the Japanese carrier that was searching, they, they, did a, they fanned out and they were searching for the American carriers. The one plane that would have found our carriers had its radio misfunction. There were things that happened on D-Day with the weather. There were many things in the Battle of the Bulge, all of these things in World War II. There was no way the Axis powers were going to win that war because it was not God's will for that to happen. God is in control. He is in control. In Jeremiah 32, verse 26 through 27, let me read it to you. It says, Then the word came to Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, is there anything too hard for me? Unquote. Nothing is too hard for God. He is Almighty God, the God of all flesh, as this verse, as this verse tells us, and nothing is too hard for Him. And He does intervene in history as needed. But let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. Excuse me. This is Isaiah 14, verse 24. Isaiah writes, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. purpose of the Lord will stand. He is in control and his purpose will be done. He is almighty God, the Lord of all the hosts, of all the hosts of angels. It's just beyond our comprehension right now. The God of all flesh, as he's told us in Jeremiah, his will will stand. Here's one of the more critical elements of his purpose. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16, if you'll turn there with me. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. John writes of a vision, <coughs> excuse me, that he saw was revealed to him. He said, now I saw heaven opened 
And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. Then he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ is surely returning to this earth. This is absolutely certain. Why? Because it is the will of Almighty God and his purpose will stand. The return of Jesus Christ to this earth will be the most momentous event in all of the history of the world. And on this day of trumpets that we are keeping today, God reminds us of this certain event that is coming. He tells us, come out of your normal routine on this day, out of the world, on this day of trumpets, and I will remind and refresh you of this certain fact. And this refreshment goes beyond just hearing about what this day means. God blesses us as we obey him and keep this day. God's spirit within us is stirred up as we know in the core of our being, brethren, what this day pictures is truly real. It's real. And it is going to happen. There is a spiritual refreshment that we need and we receive as we keep this holy day. It's one of the blessings of obeying God and keeping this day. Notice Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. If you'll turn there with me please. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. We're cutting into the sentence here, but it says, Paul writes, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. God has enlightened us or opened our minds to understand the truth. And all that means, including for us personally, And it includes something that is truly remarkable. If you notice ne next, Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. Again, we're cutting in. It says, this is Colossians 1, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us and the hope of glory. Brethren, because God has called you and me, we understand the mystery that has eluded human understanding since the beginning the very purpose of mankind's existence, why man was created. And it is to share in the glory of Almighty God. And this hope of glory is in us because God is in us. Because God is in us. Let's notice next, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Extremely encouraging scripture, brethren, in God's word. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16.
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Imagine what that will be like. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Imagine what that will be like. Then he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. This very day, the Feast of Trumpets reminds us of the amazing hope that is within us, the hope of glory. This day reminds us when our hope will be fulfilled at the most momentous event in history, the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. Jesus Christ is returning to the earth as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we will be changed and meet him in the air as this event unfolds, brethren. What an astounding event this will be. How incredible it will be. And all that we have endured to be there on that day, to be changed to immortal spirit on that day, to be glorified on that day. All we have endured in the past will seem as nothing compared to the joy that we will experience on that day. That is surely coming. That is why the Apostle Paul was inspired to write that we should therefore comfort one another with these words because it is comforting. It refreshes and it encourages us in the here and now. As we know within us by God's spirit that this is real and it stirs up that spirit within us. It encourages us and reminds us and refreshes us. Notice next Hebrews chapter six. We'll read verses 17 through 20. Hebrews chapter six. Verse 17 through 20. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge, to lay, hope, to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul or our life, both sure and steadfast, in which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The hope of eternal life and glory that is deep within us, put there by God, brethren, is an incredible anchor that encourages us. It anchors us. It anchors our life. And this day, is a powerful reminder of that hope that is in the core of our being. Again, put there by God. As he is calling us to it. And to that momentous day when Christ returns, when it is fulfilled. But we are here today and there's even more that works to help us as we keep this holy day together. We're here in Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Paul writes to the Hebrews, he says in Hebrews 10, verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting or encouraging and building up one another 
and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is that day? The day of the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. That this day reminds us of the Feast of Trumpets. But brethren, we come together, and I know some can't be here because of illness or afflictions, but we come together and we edify or we encourage one another on this day as well as all of the weekly Sabbaths. We help each other, we encourage one another. And this is another important reason for God's commanded assemblies as this day is. God in his amazing wisdom knows what he is doing. He knows what he's doing. He commands us to keep this holy day and there is an incredible blessing for those that keep it. And it's a multifaceted blessing. So on the Feast of Trumpets, we are reminded, refreshed, and encouraged. So let's move on to the third why. Why does God want us to be reminded, refreshed, and encouraged on this Feast of Trumpets? And the answer is, God strongly desires us to stay on track as he prepares us for the coming kingdom of God. It's critical that we stay on the track upon which God has placed us. The track to spiritual growth, the track to the transformation of our physical body to glory and to eternal life, to sonship in God's divine family, to the inheritance of all things that God's word tells us about to service and the joy that all of that will entail. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 through 18. Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, this is 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What we see all around us right now is temporary. It's coming by the eternal weight of glory. What price can be placed on eternal life in the glory of God? There is no price. Even the entire earth and all that is in it pales into insignificance because it is fleeting and would ultimately be unfulfilling in time. Nothing begins to compare with eternal life and sharing in the very glory of Almighty God. We must not let the temporary physical things which we can see now distract us and engulf us. As Paul writes by the inspiration of God, we must be looking toward the things that are not seen. We must always have this vision before us, brethren, the vision of the future that God has in store for us and for all mankind. The vision, again, that God has placed into us by his spirit that dwells within us. These things that are spiritual and are eternal. This is the perspective we must have and hold on to, this vision that is before us. Solomon was a very wise man, and he was wise because God gave him the gift of wisdom. Let me read what he wrote in Proverbs 4, verse 25 through 27 to you. He writes, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. 
Ponder the path of your feet. Think about where you're going, in other words. And let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left and remove your foot from evil, he writes. We are to keep our eyes straight and looking forward, not to the right or to the left or distractions of the physical life that we have now and the physical world around us. Consider your path. Don't, tor don't turn toward these things of the flesh and the world and, and don't pursue them and don't place them at the center of your life. Don't pursue them, but remove yourself from sin. Put God at the center of your life and the vision of the future that he has placed inside of you at the center of your life, the hope that is within you. Don't let this physical life and temporary things of the flesh lead you off the track that God has placed you onto, but keep looking forward to what lies ahead that is infinitely greater, fulfilling, and lasting. The eternal weight of glory, as Paul calls it. Nothing compares to that, brethren. Nothing. Apostle Paul writes about this, pardon me, some more in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. He writes, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in, Je in Christ Jesus. We must forget about the past. We must repent if need be and then forget about it as God forgets about it. We must keep pressing forward to the goal or the prize that God has set in our minds. We must keep pressing forward no matter what happens around us or to us. To lay hold of the goal as Jesus Christ has laid hold of you or is within you via the Holy Spirit. This goal is all important and we cannot lose sight of it must keep looking forward. Ask God, brethren, who, who has set this vision and goal within us to help you, to help you to keep looking forward. He will certainly help us in every way as we let him do so. Notice in Philippians chapter 1, not too far away, verse 3 through 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Paul writes, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has begun a good work in us, and he will complete it, unless we prevent that from happening ourselves. His work is to prepare us by transforming us to be like him as he prepares us for his divine family. And notice it says, until the day or the return of Jesus Christ. That is when God's work in us as mortal beings will be complete. The very day that this holy day, the Feast of Trumpets, pictures, God in his perfect wisdom reminds and refreshes us of what he is doing on this and every holy day. Again, this is one of the great blessings of obeying God and keeping his holy days. But notice what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. I'll give you just a minute to get there. Second Timothy chapter 4, 
verse 7 through 8. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We must fight the good fight, brethren, and finish the race. And a crown of righteousness will be given to us. When? On the very day that the Feast of Trumpets pictures. The day when we will be changed and will meet Jesus Christ in the air on that great day when he returns. Brethren, we can fight on and finish our race by the power of God within us. It's our choice on whether or not to allow God to help us and to use the power that is available to us. Stay close to God by prayer and Bible study and meditation and fasting. Hold fast to the Lord and, and cling to him and serve him and walk in his commandments as he is our life, as we read earlier in Joshua chapter 22, verse 5. We must keep looking forward, staying on track, and running the race toward the greatest goal imaginable, the kingdom of God, and nothing less than the glory of sonship in God's very family. There can be no goal or prize greater than that. We must finish that race to attain that prize. So let's consider the fourth why. Why does God want us to stay on track as he prepares us for the coming kingdom of God? The answer is the first fruits of God are an integral part of God's master plan as the first fruits will assist Jesus Christ to execute and complete God's plan of salvation for mankind. I'll read it again to you. The answer is the first fruits of God are an integral part of God's master plan. As the first fruits will assist Jesus Christ to execute and complete God's plan of salvation for mankind. Notice Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Blessed are those that are called the first fruits, that are part of a better resurrection, brethren. They shall be priests and will rule with Jesus Christ and we are being prepared for this now, as we heard in the Bible study this morning. We are being prepared for this now. But notice Revelation 3, verse 21. It's at the beginning of Revelation. Revelation 3, verse 21. This is Jesus Christ speaking. He says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Just consider what this means, brethren, to sit with Jesus Christ on his throne. What a privilege that will be. And we won't be going, look at me. I'm sitting on the throne here with Jesus Christ. It will not be that way, brethren. It will not. But we will be given that privilege as a first fruit. That's why the first fruits must stay on track because of the role they will play in ruling with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. What a responsibility and a blessing and a privilege this will be. But God says 
that is coming. Revelation 5 is not too far away. And the situation described here is in heaven. And there's a scroll. And the Father has this scroll. And it's going to start the day of the Lord. And no one is worthy to open this scroll except for one. And that was the Lamb of God. Notice in verse 9. These are the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. And they sang this song in verse 9. You, referring to the word of God, Jesus Christ, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. They're speaking in behalf of the first fruits here. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. God's word is very clear what the first fruits will be doing in the kingdom of God. They will have a very special relationship with Jesus Christ. A close relationship that compares to a husband and wife. And how incredible this will be. As it says when it's describing his return that we will meet him in the air and we will always be with him. Just as a husband and wife are always together. We will be ruling and serving with Jesus Christ. What a fantastic calling that is. But notice something else, brethren, in Mark chapter 10, verse 42 through 45. Mark chapter 10. There's a very important element to all of this. Mark chapter 10, verse 42. Mark chapter 10, verse 42. This is when the disciples, there was some argument about who is going to sit on Jesus' right hand or his left hand. Who is going to be there with Jesus as the most important in the kingdom of God? But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, for whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant." Whoever and whoever of you desires, desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The coming kingdom of God will not be like human government. The greatest in the kingdom of God will be servants and not the other way around. As kings and priests under Jesus Christ, the first fruits will truly serve those they rule over. And coupled with righteousness and wisdom, this attitude of humility and service will make all the difference. And that is why God tells us so many times, places in his word, to humble ourselves. And he'll help us to do that. Because humility is so very important in many respects. But one of those is in preparing us the first fruits for service in the kingdom of God. As we will serve with humility. Those that are under us. We are their servants. That is completely opposite of human government. And yet there's another element of the role of the first fruits in the future. God's word tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. We won't turn there. But it says something that is astounding to me. It says that the first fruits will judge angels. I can't imagine what that will be like. But God will certainly trust us to do this. And we will be equipped to do it at that time. It is yet another indication of the big role that the first fruits will play in the future. And yet there is another very special element to the role of the first fruits in the kingdom of God. Notice Isaiah chapter 30, verse 19 through 21. Isaiah 
Isaiah chapter 30, verse 19 through 21. This is talking about the future after the return of Jesus Christ. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. You will be very gracious. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. But your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears, so your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Wherever you turn to the right hand or whether you turn, whenever you turn to the left. Brethren, we understand this to mean that the first fruits will be working with human beings during the millennium and during the great, great white throne judgment period. And you know something? It is going to be joyful. It is going to be joyful. Is there going to be difficulty? Absolutely. But it is going to be joyful. You know, God's word tells us that the angels rejoice when a human being repents and turns away from sin. Why? Because this is such a critical decision that affects the eternal future of that person. Imagine what it, what it will be like to teach your relatives and your friends, your family members, whose minds have been opened, the truth of God. Imagine what that will be like. It will be a fantastic privilege it will be a blessing both to them and to us. We can relate to what they need to do, as we heard also this morning in the Bible study. We can relate to what they need to do and what they need to overcome because we lived it ourselves. And as glorified sons of God, we will have great wisdom and patience to humbly serve them in this critically important way. And this personal service to human beings in the millennium and later in the great white throne judgment is also a testament to God's great wisdom. What an impact it will have on human beings who need to be, to be comforted and healed and encouraged, some who have gone through absolutely horrible things during the tribulation period, or went through horrible things before that in World War II, and all the atrocities that happened. We're in concentration camps. We're gonna be helping all of these people as sons of God, as first fruits in God's kingdom. We will be there for them. And what a blessing it will be to them to have this personal interaction, an example before them. And that we will have the joy of serving them in this way. Not only our families and our relatives and our friends, but others that desperately need to be taught, but whose minds have now been opened. This also shows, brethren, the love of God in a powerful way, doesn't it? Imagine the joy that you will experience with them as they repent and they turn away from sin and begin to grow spiritually just as we did eventually being changed to spirit as glorified sons of God, just as we were changed earlier. And we will be there when their change occurs. What a privilege this will be. This joy will be overwhelming to all concerned. It will be overwhelming. And it will be a great joy to us 
to have helped so many people, to have served them with humility. The first fruits of God are an important part of God's plan of salvation for all mankind. They're an important part. So now let's consider the fifth why. Why does God's master plan of salvation need to be executed and completed? The answer is so the divine family of God will come to exist in all of its glory. Allow me to read Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 5. This is a very familiar part of scripture written by David. He says, when I consider your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Unquote. So David asks, what is man compared to the size and glory of the universe, which reflects God's power and glory? That God would be concerned about mankind. David saw by God's Holy Spirit within him the, incredibly, the incredible destiny of mankind to be changed and to receive glory and honor in the future. Now let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 through 13. We'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 through 13. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6 through 13. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? He's quoting David. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and have set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in all that that he put in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Yet now we do not yet see all things put under him, referring to man. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, by whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies or sets apart and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I in the children whom God has given to me. Well, Paul is, is quoting David here in this passage. But then he's adding even more to what David wrote. Not only is man's potential to be crowned with glory and honor, but that Jesus Christ himself, a descendant of David, would be the brother of those who will be glorified. The implication of this, brethren, is truly astounding. It's easy to read over this, but what this is telling us is astounding. It means that glorified beings, formerly mortal human beings, will be in the very family of God, a family that presently consists of God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. This is truly astounding, brethren. But we know that it is true. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 17. Again, I, I, I know I've mentioned this before, but I believe Romans chapter 8 is my favorite scripture in all the Bible. That one chapter is just so profound and is so encouraging Romans chapter 8 verse 16 
Paul writes, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit, the spirit in man within us, within our minds, that we are children of God. And if heir, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. We know in the core of our being that we are God's children now, but we are still in the flesh because of God's spirit within us. The very power and presence of God, the power that will change and quicken our mortal bodies in the future. On the day that this day that we're keeping pictures. And we have, as I mentioned earlier, this powerful hope within us that we will be glorified in the future as God's children. Failure is not an option. We must finish the race and allow God to finish his work in us as we've seen today. This is our destiny. But notice here in Romans 8, what Paul says in verse 29, he says, or he writes, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that we may be the firstborn among many brethren. We are to be conformed to the image of God's son. And what exactly does this mean? The answer is we are to become like Jesus Christ. As Paul, John, and Peter wrote by inspiration of God, we are to become like Jesus Christ without sin. We are to strive to become more and more like him as God works with us by his spirit. But the full fulfillment of the scripture is yet in the future. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, if you'll turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. It says, And he himself, referring to Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of, of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We will become perfect to the measure of the stature of Christ when we are changed to spirit at the return of Jesus Christ at this holy day pictures. In the future, when we are changed to spirit, we will be like Jesus in his glory. And we shall see him as he is, as the apostle Paul, or the apostle John wrote in John chapter three. We shall see Jesus as he is, and we will be like him, and we will be his brother. He will be our brother. Of course, there, if there is any doubt that we are to become part of God's divine family, the Apostle Peter makes it very clear. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, and this is our last scripture today. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. says, or he writes, <clears throat> grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be what? You may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We will be partakers of the divine nature. We will be like God. We, will, we shall see him as he is. We will be in the God family. 
we will be God as part of God's divine family, divine family. Forty years ago this year, when God was first calling me, I struggled greatly with this element of God's truth, that we would become God. It seemed blasphemous to me as a Catholic or an ex-Catholic. And I tried to prove it was not true. But I did ask God to help me to prove it or disprove it. And I think you can guess which way it went. God opened my mind to finally see this incredible truth in all its beauty, brethren. And the words thankful and grateful do not begin to express what I feel toward God for opening my mind to see this because it, it changed my life and my future and it's changed all of our lives and all of our futures. And it will to all of those who will see and hold on to this element of God's truth. It is the reason why God created mankind itself. And it is, it's almost unbelievable. And yet it's true. And we know that it's true because God is in us and we know it's true. We know we are the children of God as Paul wrote in Romans 8. So this unbelievable truth that God is effectively reproducing himself and building up his divine family is why God's plan of salvation will certainly be executed and completed. God's family will come to exist in all of its glory. And God tells us the whole creation eagerly waits for it. And it is an absolute certainty. God's will will stand, as we saw earlier. So after five whys, we've come to the wonderful root answer as to why we are here today. It is because God is executing a fantastic plan that the world is blinded to see at this time. But they will see it in the future. Just not now, not yet. We've had the privilege of seeing it now. A plan to bring many sons to glory. A plan to greatly expand God's divine family. We are here today because God is calling us to be part of the plan as well as part of his family. What a privilege this is that we will even more fully appreciate in the future as it will be a great joy to be part of. And I'm talking about when we're going to be serving and helping others. We will be both part of the plan and we will also be part of the end result, the family of God. So today we saw that the answer to why we are here is so important. It's so important. This is not just another day as it is with the world around us. This holy day is a special day with a special purpose and a powerful spiritual blessing for those who keep it. God is preparing his church. Those of us here in this room and around the world that are part of his first fruits, preparing us on an individual basis for specific positions in his kingdom to rule with Jesus Christ on his throne and to serve, to truly serve others and to share in the joy that will come from that and to serve with humility. So today on the Feast of Trumpets, God intends for us to be reminded, refreshed and encouraged about this very fact of who 
we are and what God is doing and what is surely coming in the future. And this refreshing and encouragement occurs not only by what we physically hear, but by the stirring of God's Holy Spirit within us as we hear it and we think about it. I sincerely and humbly hope that you were reminded and refreshed and encouraged by what we have seen today in God's Word. I certainly was in studying and preparing this message with God's constant help, which I continuously needed. Our God is truly great and worthy of worship. Enjoy the incredible blessing of God's Feast of Trumpets.